In Linux Essentials Lab 13, where data is stored, we will learn the locations of kernel information, process information, libraries, log files, and software packages. We're going to investigate how the proc system is used by the kernel. We're going to use the ps commands to view process information, learn how to manage processes by starting, stopping, and resuming them, viewing log files, and manage the ability to load shared libraries. In 13.2, the kernel and slash proct, we are told about the slash proc directory, and we're told that it is not like a normal directory, and instead it's a pseudo file system maintained in the memory of the computer. It contains subdirectories for every running process on our system, and special programs such as ps and top. In the slash proc slash system subdirectory, it contains files that can be used to alter the settings of our running terminal. We don't want to alter the files in here since they're not real files, they're just being displayed. So if we want to alter them, we would use the echo or system control command to overwrite the contents here. And the same for viewing files. You don't want to view them in here, but use the cat or system control command to. In 13.2.1, step one, we will examine some of the files in our slash proc directory. We want to be in the root user to do this. So I'm going to clear a terminal and do a su for su. And then we have to enter the password, which is netlab123. Once we're in our root, we're going to do ls slash proc. And that will list all of the things in our proc. Keep in mind, everything with a number is what's currently running on our system. So if it has a number like this, it's currently running. And then we're given more information about this down here. Now we're going to use cat, but we could also use ps to view information about our directory process, which is the slash sbin slash init process. And this is the process that runs when the system starts up, and it's given the process identifier of one. The reason why we have this echo command right after our other command that's separated by a semicolon is to put our next command prompt on a new line. That's all it's there for. So if we press enter, we're going to get the slash sbin slash init. Now if we do the ps-p1, we're going to get this output. Remember, the slash proc directory, it doesn't just contain information about commands, it also contains information about our operating system. It also contains devices like memory, disks, network interfaces, mic, monitors, and others. We're going to use the cat to read this, and then our slash proc slash command line to see what arguments were passed to the kernel at boot time. And these were the arguments. This output contains all the information, such as command line of parameters, special instructions, and more. That was passed to the kernel when it first booted up. Now we're moving on to 13.3, managing processes. In this task, we will start and stop processes. In 13.3.1, we're told to use ping localhost and send it to the slash dev slash null. We can see that we never really get our command line back. We can type in here, but we can't go into our command line to execute. And this is because the command is running in the foreground, and a process running in the foreground will prevent the user from using the shell until that certain process is complete. If a process is running in the background, it'll allow the user to use the shell and execute other commands while it runs. The system will continue to be like this, or ping, until the process it's currently in running until the process it's currently running is terminated or suspended. To terminate the process, all you need to do is do a control C and it will break us out of this. To have a process run in the background instead of the foreground, all we need to do is type it out and we're going to use the same thing, ping localhost and we're sending it to slash dev slash null again, basically the same command. However, this time we're going to have the and symbol after it. Doing this, we'll have it run in the background. This first number in these brackets is the process's job number. The next number right here is the process ID. It's important to know the process ID for certain processes because we can use this to manipulate them. To see what commands are running inside of our current terminal, we can use the jobs command. Typing this out will give us this output. We can see that we have one running and where it's running at in the background. In 13.3.5, we're gonna start another ping command in the background. We're going to do the same exact thing where we have ping localhost and this is going to slash dev slash null and then we just have an and remember the and is just to get it to run in the background if we do this we are going to see that it has similar output to the previous one but there is a slight difference there is a new job number and a new process id as well and since we've created this right after the other it just goes up one more step so if we do this again we can further demonstrate this now if we type jobs 
we're going to see that we have three running in the background. To bring a command that is running to the foreground, all we need to do is FG percent symbol and one. If we do this, it brings it to the foreground. The ping command has once again taken control of our terminal and we are not able to type anything in here. We can like this, but it's not going to do anything. To pause the program instead of end it, remember ending it is control C. But if we want to pause it, we're going to do a control Z. And this stops or suspends the program. To have the process continue to execute in the background instead of the foreground, instead of doing FG, we're going to do BG percentage sign one. And this one is for the job that it's running. If we wanted a job two, we would do job two. If we wanted a job three, we would do job three. And now it's running in the background. If we do the jobs again, we can see that we have all three still running in the background. This is a great way to check if we have commands currently running, and if they're not running, then do something about it. If we have our jobs set like this, we can use the specific job number and kill that job. If we type in kill, the percent sign and then the actual job number we will do job two and press enter it'll kill that job if we type in jobs again we can see that we have one running one terminated and the third one running as well if we want to kill all commands like let's say something bad happens and you want to just stop everything you will use kill all and then ping and this terminates the one and three and this gives us output if we type in jobs we can see that we don't have any more jobs in 13.4, we're going to use the top command to work with processes. By default, the top program sorts the processes in descending order of percentage for CPU usage. So the programs with the heaviest CPU usage will be on the top, and as you go down, you'll get less and less CPU usage. So previously we cleared all of our jobs. Now we want to bring back two new ones. This is for examples that we are about to do. So we can just bring them back by doing ping, localhost, and then just sending them to the dev null. And we're making two of them. And we can see that we have this one job, now we have a second job, and we have the different IDs for the processes. Now we're going to start using the top command. So if we type in top, our output should look like this. And by default, the top command changes every two seconds. So if we watch it for two seconds, we can see that something on the screen is going to change. The top command is an interactive program, meaning that we can issue commands within this program. We can type the letter K, and we can see a prompt has appeared right here. PID to signal slash kill, default PID is 1. If we want to kill something, we would just type in their PID. So if we wanted to kill 47, the system admin user, we would do 47, press enter, and then it says send PID signal 15 slash sig term, and then we just type in 15. Pressing enter here, we can see that it is now gone. That did not work because the signal, which was 15, did not kill it. We can try this again with number 9 instead. If we press K for kill, and then the PID 47, press enter. Instead of hitting 15 as it asks, we are going to do 9. And the reason why we're doing 9 is because the kill signal 9 is more forceful, and it cannot be ignored unlike the default 15. If we press enter now, we can see that it has been removed from 47 and I basically just restarted the terminal. If we were still in this terminal, if I did not close it out, we could press Q to exit the top command and then the screen after that will show which commands were terminated and which were killed. In 13.5 we are introduced to the P kill and kill to terminate processes. To do this I'm going to go back into my root user. Now on my root user I'm going to make the following commands and they are both running in the background. The sleep command is typically used to pause a program shell script for a specific period of time. In this case, we're just going to provide a command that will take a long time to run. We're going to use the jobs command to see what programs are currently running. And we can see that both of these sleeps are running. First, we're going to use PS, and if we use PS, we can see all of the PIDs. Now, we want to kill the first sleep we know the first sleep has the PID of 75. So we are going to do kill 75. This is the PID that we want to kill. Pressing enter here, we can press jobs and press enter and see that we terminated the first sleep. To terminate a command, if we don't know the PID and we just know the name, we can do that too. But we are going to do P kill, the negative 15, which remember is the command to kill, and then sleep. This will kill the second job running. 
So if we do jobs again, we can see that there is nothing running. In 13.6, we are going to be introduced to PS, and this is for select and sorting processes. The PS command is used to view processes like we saw right here, and by default, the PS command will only display processes running in the current shell. Before we start this example, we're going to start up a background process using ping and view current processes with the PS. So we'll do a ping, this creates it, localhost, and then we are sending it to our slash dev slash null. And to make it run in the background, we have the and symbol. We're given a job number and PID. If we do PS, we can see that it is currently running and we could identify it by its PID or its name. To display more than what is just running currently, we will do ps-e. So this shows all the processes that are currently on the system. If we wanted to specify which columns we want to output, we would do ps with the dash o option and then the columns. If we do that, we are gonna get our PID. So now we get all of these options, which is a little bit more than what we just had up here. Now we can specify which columns we want to sort by. By default, a column specified for sorting will be in an ascending order. This can be forced with placing a plus symbol in front of the column name. And to specify in descending order, we're going to use the minus symbol in front of that column name. So we're going to do ps-o, so we print out some more information, but only specific columns of information, like this CPU. It's here, but it's not up here. We added that in. And then we made sure everything else just got printed out with it. So now we come to our memory. So after command, instead of having a comma, we're going to have a space and then do a dash dash sort percent sign and then our mem to get the memory. If we press enter here, we can see that this row has our memory in it. As we can see, this does not show a lot of information about memory. To get more information about memory, we can use the free command. We can see the total memory that we have, how much we've used, and how much is free for memory and for swap. We have one command running in the background. If we want to kill it, we are just going to do kill, and then that ID. I don't remember it though, so I'm going to do PS to get the ID. I can see that the ping is 80 ID, so I will do kill 80, and this should kill that job. I'll do jobs again just to check. We can see that it is now terminated. I use the free command again, and now we can see we actually have a little bit more memory free than used after we killed this job. In 13.7, we're introduced to system logs. These are critical for many tasks. This can include fixing OS problems and ensuring that our system is optimally secured. There are two types of diamonds that handle log messages. We have system log D and the K log D. The K log D only handles kernel log messages and its log information is sent to sys log D. The D message command or the D M E S G allows viewing of kernel messages which are stored in the slash bar slash log slash d message file. It can also provide control of whether those messages will appear in a terminal console window. And then we're given more information about logging files. We're gonna go into our system logs here. So I'm gonna clear this and do ls dash var dash log. And then we get this information here. These are the logs stored in this directory. Each log represents something special. We're told more about that here. And we are also shown that in here if we type in ssh localhost, we can see that our authenticity cannot be established. Do we want to continue connecting? For this, I'm just going to press yes. We've permanently added localhost to the lists of hosts. Now we're asked for the password. And if we don't know the password, I'm just going to press Q and enter. And it says permission denied. Please try again. Nothing is going to happen. I'll do it again, but with the letter F and nothing happens again. I'll try it one more time by doing LOL, pressing enter we can see that the permission denied again, and it kicked us out. Now, if we want to see all of these failed attempts, we can use the tail command with the dash five option to see the last five, and then our directory, which is slash var slash log. And then inside of this directory, we have our auth dot log, which we can see right here. And this will show the login attempts. If we press enter, we can see all of the times that we tried to log in, but failed. And that is all for this lab. 13 where data is stored. If you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments below. If you want more Linux essentials, there's a playlist as well as notes in the description.